envying one another. Galatians <laughs> and its companion, Galatians. Somebody got it. All right. Quick question. How many of you currently do or recently found spoiled fruit in your house? Mm hmm. I hope we're talking about physical, not spiritual. But there's a connection. I said we've talked about fruit all day today, and now we come to this idea. What do we do <clears throat> with spoiled fruit? Well, the first thought is throw it out. Get rid of it. Well, let's talk about that. What do we do with spoiled fruit? I want you to turn to the text we've been using all day. We're in Galatians chapter 5, and we're going to start in verse 26 and go through chapter 6 and verse 10. And we're going to think about how or what we do with spoiled fruit. Now, first of all, let's identify what we mean by spoiled fruit. There is evidence available... <coughs> For you to know that the fruit is either heading that way or it's already spoiled. For instance, bruising. You see the bruising on the fruit? You think, uh-huh, getting soft, we got a problem, something's about to happen. Or maybe you see those little fruit flies hanging around. Well, now, it's been there long enough that you're actually breeding new life in that fruit. we got some real problems. And if you wait long enough, then you'll have the smell of the decaying fruit. Now, that evidence says it's time to do something. This fruit has to be dealt with. There's a problem here. And so when I see that evidence, I know that we have a fruit problem in our midst. Let's begin verse 26 of Galatians 5. And let me ask you as we read it again, have you thought about the real meaning of this verse? Here are the evidences of spoiled fruit, spiritually speaking. Let us not become conceited provoking one another, envying one another. Now, let's put this in context. We've been given the list of the works of the flesh. And you remember this morning, that word is plural. You're supposed to look at each one of them individually because any one of them can keep you away from God. We've been given the list of the fruit of the Spirit. That original Greek word is a singular word. It's asking you to look at this whole thing as a group, not choice. I'll take this one like I'm going to this grocery store. And I'll pick this fruit and I'll pick that, but I don't like that one. No, no. You can't pick and choose the fruit of the Spirit. We have to take every, it's a group thing. You've got to take it all. And after doing that, he then says, number one, don't become conceited. The first evidence of spoiled spiritual fruit is the decaying smell of spiritual conceit. I want you to let that rest on your mind a minute. Because if you keep this verse in context, the meaning changes. <clears throat> we all know what conceit is. The original word means empty glory. That's what it means. So it means you're bragging about something of which you have no right to brag. There is no substance. There is no support for what you're talking about. You are conceited. And don't you often find yourselves in a situation where the smell 
of conceit is nearby. You just feel it. Now, admittedly, it's not right to judge people on first impressions fully. We can't help it. But oftentimes, we get in the presence of someone and we go, Ooh, there's something wrong about that guy. He thinks too much of himself. Well, this verse is not talking about the general concept of arrogance. Who's he talking to? Christian people. And what's he saying? You better be careful not to have spiritual conceit. I think he's telling his readers. If you have an arm that's beating yourself on the back saying, Oh, look how spiritual I am. I think he's talking to people who are holding themselves up as examples and there's nothing there to prove that they should. It's a false sense of status in your spiritual condition. And he said, you better beware of the decaying smell of spiritual conceit. When we have decided that we have arrived, when we begin to think that I'm okay and everything's fine and I don't need to check myself and I don't need, we have a problem. The fruit is beginning to spoil. And at this point, the smell of decay has already happened. Number two, also don't provoke one another. The evidence of spoiled spiritual fruit is there when you see the fruit flies of provoking other people. Now that word has a good use to it. The Hebrew writer says, provoke one another to love and good works. Well, that's obviously not what this means because he's saying, beware not to do this. Well, if we're supposed to provoke to good works, then what is the problem here? What's the spoiled fruit going on here? I'll tell you what it is, I think. I think this is a case where these conceited Christians are looking at somebody else and saying, you need to work. You're missing something. Where is your good fruit? I don't see it. You don't have any. This is a word that means to jab. You know how some people just know how to jab you just right. Those people that know we say which buttons to push, that's what this is about. This is about someone who says, I'm going to show you how wrong you are, and I'm going to point out all of your faults. I am going to, and I can do it. Because after all, I've already arrived. Because you see, the conceit leads to provoking other people and showing them how desperate their situation is. Number three, envying one another. Now we get the evidence of a bruising of your spiritual condition. I think that this is the other side of the coin. I think this is the side where a Christian looks at another one and says, I sure do wish I had what you have. I want your gift. I want your blessing. 
I'm not any good because you have something I don't have. I think this is a desire on Christians to take from someone else. It's envy is not about saying, I'd like to have something similar to what you have. I, I'd like to have my own possession of that. No. Envying is about taking what you have. Envy is more like saying, not only do you have it and I want it, I don't want you to have it. So the envying would say, once the conceit is set in, and you've begun provoking other people and pointing out all of their errors, there might be some that are higher and better off, and so now you want to dethrone them from their position. I want to take you out of where you are, put you down so that I can be there, envying one another. These are the evidences of spoiled spiritual fruit. Now, you've seen it. We've all been around it. And at times, many of us may have been tempted by it. But Paul says, you better watch it. Because if you are setting yourself up in a conceited way as an arrived Christian. And therefore, you start jabbing other people who are not where you are in your opinion. And you start trying to bring down those that you think are higher than you so that you can have their position. Your spiritual fruit has been damaged. And I'm thinking about Maybe you are too. The people that Jesus constantly confronted, those holier than thou Pharisees, Sadducees, and scribes, they wanted to have the preeminence, they wanted a position, but their fruit was spoiled. Second then, after we've identified the evidence of the spoiled fruit, now we need to figure out what are we going to do with it. What are you going to do when you see the spoiled fruit? Now, we're talking about ourselves and in other people, but notice what he says starting in verse 1. Brethren, if a man is overtaken in a fault, you who are spiritual... Restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness. When you see spoiled fruit, be gentle. Let me ask you something. <laughs> Have you ever had this pile of fruit? And, and you go in to grab one, and you don't see that one in there that is messed up. And you go to grab a piece of fruit and your fingers just go all inside that all spoiled one. You've had that, haven't you? And what are you going to do to get that out? See, people know this. I, I don't know what it is. Car oil, mud, dirt, I don't mind. But food on my hands drives me crazy. My kids, my grandkids, they start eating like this, you know? And then they want me to clean them up. Nope. I ain't doing it. You know, that's just not me. Well, how am I going to get rid of that fruit? I know this. I'm not going to go like this and throw it away. Oh, no. I don't want to touch it, but I also don't want the rest of the fruit to have all that stuff smeared all over, right? How are you going to get it out? Gently. Gently. What does Paul say? When you see spoiled fruit, be gentle. You don't just dive in and grab it. 
you be gentle and take care of it. Number two, but protect yourself. Considering yourself lest you also be tempted. I'll protect myself with a pair of gloves or a towel or something because I don't want to get my fingers lodged in that dirty fruit. When we see spoiled fruit and we're going to try to remove it, we better make sure that we protect ourselves because when you go in there to try and help remove that fruit, you can get some on you and it may damage you spiritually. That's no reason not to attempt to deal with it, but protect yourself. And then third, bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. Work together with everybody to take care of the situation. If there is spoiled fruit amongst us, gently protecting ourselves, all of us try to help with that spoiled fruit. Because that's what God wants us to do. And so we should work together as a team. We should work together as a family. We should, in fact, be a united group that says, we're going to help. We're going to help remove, restore, fix spoiled fruit. Okay. Once I've figured out what the evidence is, how that spoiled fruit looks, once I've figured out what I'm going to do with it when I see it, the third thing I have to do is to decide, what am I going to do to inhibit future fruit spoiling? What am I going to do? Well, you, you've just gone into the fruit basket there on the counter, and you got the bad fruit out of there. Now, you better get ready because the rest of that fruit, potential spoiling. What are you going to do? What are you going to do immediately to make sure the rest of it is not contaminated? Let's see what Paul says, spiritually speaking. Verse 3. If anyone thinks himself to be something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. Beware of self-deception. If I am involved with others in helping get spoiled fruit out, I should make sure that I don't deceive myself into thinking, oh, my fruit will never spoil. It won't happen to me. Because any one of us can have our fruit spoiled. So we better not be self-deceived people. If you just move that fruit off of that basket of fruit and you think, oh, the rest of it's fine. The rest of it's not going to happen. Nothing's going to happen to it. You've deceived yourself into thinking that if you don't do anything else, the rest of that fruit's going to be fine. It's not. Therefore, let each one examine his own work. Then he'll have rejoicing in himself alone and not in another. Practice self examination. I don't want to be self-deceived. So I'm going to practice self-examination. I'm willing to look at me and say, is my fruit spoiling? I feel pretty good about it, but I better check. Once you've moved that fruit out of that basket, now what's the next thing you need to do? Let's look at the rest of it. Let's just move some more around and make sure the next time you dip into that fruit basket, your fingers don't go into another spoiled piece. Self-examination. Are you willing? Are we willing to sit with our lives 
and examine ourselves based on the fruit of the Spirit? Because if all of them are not a part of our lives, then not one of them can save us, we saw this morning. So I need to practice self-examination. Number three, I need to practice self-control. Verse number five, each one shall bear his own burden. Oh, I know that Paul said we should bear each other's burdens. That's exactly right. But he also says my primary responsibility is for me to bear my burden. If I'm not willing to bear it, then nobody else should have to bear it for me. The text seems to be saying that when you bear someone else's burdens, you're helping them bear it. You're not carrying it for them without their input. And that's what he's saying. He's saying we need to bear our own burdens. Self-control. Are you willing? Am I willing to think about my own fruit situation and bear up under the difficulties or the problems that I have? Am I willing to acknowledge and say, okay, I'm going to work on this and I'm going to work on this and then I can get somebody else in a matter of accountability to help me succeed. Number four, verse six. Let him who is taught in the word share in all good things with him who teaches. To prevent future spoiling of fruit, let us be gracious, let us be aware and attentive and constantly thanking other people who are helping us have better fruit. Who are helping us Keep our fruit from spoiling. When's the last time that you went to a brother or sister in Christ simply to say, thank you for encouraging me. Thank you for praying for me. Thank you for helping me. And when was the last time you simply sent a text to somebody that said, I'm praying for you. I know what you're going through. I just want you to know I'm praying for you. You see, these are people that are teaching us by their examples. They're teaching us in Bible classes, literally, or they're teaching us in so many ways. And if others around are there helping you, we should be appreciative of it. Because when I'm thinking about them and how they're helping me keep my fruit from spoiling, there's a much better chance that it will not. Do not be deceived. God's not mocked. Whatever a man sows, he will also reap. He who sows to the flesh will of the flesh reap corruption. He who sows to the Spirit will of the Spirit reap everlasting life. Put your fruit in a place where it won't spoil as quickly. I notice there are all kinds of things that people say will help your fruit to keep from spoiling. For instance, there's that hook thing that stands up like this however it stands, hang your bananas on it. I don't know if that works or not. I mean, if you don't want to go buy something, just, you know, hang it on the handle of the counter for a while or something. I, I don't know if it works or not. Couldn't tell you. I read that there are some fruits you're supposed to put in the refrigerator to keep them from spoiling, but there are some fruits that get worse if you put them in the refrigerator to keep them from spoiling. I don't know which is which. But I know this, if I have a basket of fruit and one or two of them have spoiled, probably I need to move that somewhere else. Maybe it means just take the fruit out, clean the basket. 
Maybe it means separate the fruit. I don't know what it means, but I know this. I'm not going to leave it there. Because it's already been proven that over there is where it spoils. I'm going to move it. So to the Spirit. If you're having trouble with your fruit, if you feel like your fruit is spoiling, then take a look where you are. Where are you? Are you around people who are always influencing you to have spoiled fruit? Or are you around people who are encouraging? Where are you? If, you're, if your fruit is spoiling a little bit and you see yourself or feel yourself being more disconnected from the Lord, where are you? Are you taking advantage of every opportunity to assemble with people who are here to help you keep from spoiling spiritually? You taking advantage of opportunities? Not that anyone has the time to be involved in everything, but I know this. I'm constantly finding out about new things that are happening that allow people to be involved that I didn't even know about. Investigate some of those. There are ongoing weekly Bible studies, some in person, some online. Get involved. There are fellowship activities where the encouragement to keep fruit from spoiling is pretty obvious. Get involved. You want to keep it from spoiling? Put it in a place where it is less likely to spoil. Verse 9. And let us not grow weary in well-doing, for in due season we will reap if we do not lose. Keep alert Keep alert about the condition of the fruit in an ongoing way. Keep alert. Let us not grow weary in well-doing. Let us not give up. Let us not stop. The fruit needs constant attention. So don't quit. Keep checking on that fruit. Keep moving that fruit around. Keep it from spoiling. And finally, verse 10, therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all, especially to those who are of the household of faith. You know what the best way, proven way, absolute solid way, undeniable way to keep fruit from spoiling? Think for just a minute. There's only one way. Guaranteed, absolute certain that fruit won't spoil. You know what it is? Eat it quickly. It won't spoil. Fruit spoils when you just let it lie around for a while. Eat it. Put it in something that you're going to eat. In other words, use it. If you don't want to have spoiled spiritual fruit, put it to use. Don't let it just lie around. We have spiritual fruit right here in the Word of God. But if this fruit, for instance, is sitting in a prominent position where you see it, but every now and then when you move it, there's an outline of dust, hmm, it's not being used. When we read about it and we try to incorporate it, but we don't put ourselves in positions to put the fruit into action. It might be in our minds, we might have moved it from here to here, but until we move it from here to here, then the fruit still could spoil by just lying around in our minds, doing nothing. 
We spent an entire day talking about fruit. Jesus used that analogy many times. Because fruit is something you see. Fruit is something that's obvious. And that's what he wants his people to be.